Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another presentation in our engineering virtual speaker series. My name is Nenad Gusunski, and I am professor and chairman of civil and environmental engineering. I will be also host hosting today's event. Today's presentation is very timely. Our country and the world are going through the most difficult pandemic in the past hundred years. The fight against the pandemic is taking many forms. One of the very important ones is investigations on the virus transmission within our communities or organizations. Today's speaker, Dr. Nicole Pannenfeld, will tell us a bit how, maybe a little bit surprising, our wastewater infrastructure can be used to monitor for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that is causing COVID-19 disease. As a part of her presentation, Dr. Pannenfeld will also talk a bit about how sewers work, provide some fundamentals on information that can be obtained from sewers, and she will also present some data or results from the studies related to antibiotic resistance. Dr. Pannenfeld is Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. She received her bachelor's degree from Johns Hopkins University, her master's degree from Clemson University, and finally her doctorate in environmental engineering from Virginia Tech. Dr. Ferenfeld's research group works at the interface of environmental chemistry and microbiology to promote water quality and sustainability. Since joining Radger School of Engineering in 2013, Dr. Ferenfeld had many research accomplishments. Probably the most significant one among those is receiving a prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. So before I pass the word to Dr. Farnenfeld, I would just like to mention that at the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So if you will have any questions, uh, please write those questions at any time in our chat room. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this virtual stage to Dr. Farnenfeld. Nicole, the stage is yours. Can I get a thumbs up? You can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for, for joining me today, albeit virtually. I got a chance to glance through the list of folks who had registered. It was such an impressive list of alumni and students and colleagues. Um, it just made me so excited for when we can meet again in person. So until then, I'll share some of the tools for the little part that our lab can do to help with the current situation. So I'll tell you today about some of the research we've been doing in our lab and, and how we got there. So we started thinking about studying microbes in sewers um, early when I joined Rutgers, in part because we were doing work on combined sewer overflows. So if you're familiar with combined sewers, they're um, an outdated infrastructure, but they were great, great infrastructure for their time. Basically, they take stormwater and wastewater into the same pipe. Um, we were interested in questions like, um, do you, um, what, when do you see pathogens come out? How do you treat them from these untreated wastewaters that would be um, emitted into the environment? And one of the big motivating factors was, here's a map of New Jersey, you can see, and everywhere there's a red dot, there's a, a combined sewer outflow. Um, so that got us starting to think about the, the microbes in sewers. Um, and I was also inspired by some of the work that our colleagues were doing across the river, Lisa Rodenberg and Donna Fennell, our faculty in environmental sciences. And they had this really cool study thinking about um, biotransformation that occurs in the collection systems. They could actually demonstrate dechlorination of PCBs in the sewers, which is, which is just crazy. Like it shouldn't, you wouldn't expect that to be happening. Um, so it's not surprising, but really interesting biological activity they were measuring in there. And I was aware of some of the work some of my colleagues had done uh, when I was an undergrad, some of the grad students were doing this type of work, um, monitoring illicit drug use. So this is just one example uh, I pulled from the literature where they, they show you how they can 
not only measure the illicit drugs, so here cocaine, morphine, um, ecstasy uh, in sewage, um, but you can also see the weekly patterns. No surprise that folks start to have a little more use on the weekends. Um, here, this is cocaine, and what you're looking at this is, my understanding is a metabolite of cocaine. So this was from Milan sewers, and there's been a lot of work in, in Europe, especially, um, as well as Australia, and some in the U.S. doing this type of work, um, going into the sewers to look for public health information. So working with uh, my colleague who had been at uh, working at Johns Hopkins as a grad student when I was an undergrad, we, we joined forces and we started thinking about, you know, could we use the sewers to monitor for antibiotic resistance? Um, it wouldn't be surprising. We definitely know that antibiotic resistant microbes are in um, people's guts and in their feces. We know that wastewater, we try to treat it to remove these, but we started thinking like, well, let's go a little further up in the system and think about what we would need to know in order to do this so-called urban sewage epidemiology for the resistant microbes. Um, and the last piece that kind of brought this to our lab, I think, was the Ebola outbreak. Um, I was speaking to friends that worked at major utilities that were getting hospital effluent from facilities that were taking in the Ebola patients. And <clears throat> like SARS-CoV-2, Ebola is, both of them were fortunate that it's not necessarily well well transmitted in the like fecal oral wastewater route. Um, but it did raise a lot of questions, you know, even if wastewater is good at or treatment plants are good at inactivating these microbes, viruses, um, what about folks that are working further up the system? So kind of all of these were floating around in, in our minds. Um, but I don't want to take credit for this. It's far from a new idea, monitoring sewage for markers of pathogens. Um, I pulled this from the literature. It's a study from my alma mater from 1967. And here's their text. For example, by appropriate sampling, one might be able to monitor a housing project, an apartment building, or perhaps an even a single household, or maybe even a dorm, like folks have been hearing about in the news, some of the studies from Arizona and other places. So these are not, uh, it's not a, the newest idea. It's been done for viruses for a while, but the, the new thing here is applying it in such a wider scale that we're seeing for, for COVID. So the thing that interests us about this on some level is also the engineering considerations. Um, it's easy to take a wastewater sample, do it appropriately, and, and measure and find some pathogens in it. But the, the challenge can be back calculating. If you're just going right outside a, a dorm, there might not be much happening. There isn't much residence time in the pipes. Um, but if you're going all the way at a wastewater intake, there's certainly some considerations. So one thing that we've studied, uh, particularly with the antibiotic resistance, is looking for the difference between the microbial communities that might be in a separate sewer for a com than a combined sewer. So again, a separate sewer is taking um, all the, the sanitary, all the, the sewage, everything that goes down your, your pipes in your home, except like your rainwater. Um, so what you flush down the toilet, what goes down the sink, your shower water uh, and such, and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, uh, the combined sewer again would also be mixing in storm water on, on storm occasions. And also not all of it would be reaching the wastewater treatment plant necessarily during wet weather. There's also considerations, not only knowing how many people are in the so-called catchment that are contributing to this wastewater, um, but there's variability in how much water they consume. Um, and then there's, uh, and this can vary regionally, that's what I'm showing you here, the average per capita wastewater residential flow rates. Um, <clears throat> you can get an idea for which areas here are creating more. Um, but there's also some variations that would be interesting in a place like New Jersey, if you think about, we have tourists, right? So there's some places where um, if you just look at the census data, perhaps you're not capturing the, the whole picture of who is contributing to a, a sewer at any given time. Um, of course, you would also, in some of the larger systems, depending on where you sample, you might have industrial flows. And another concern that you'd have, especially with our older systems, is Although it's kind of my understanding is pretty universal that you would have some what we call I and I, 
infiltration and inflow. Um, these could be, uh, you know, perhaps a cross connection from a, a storm sewer to the sanitary sewer, um, even in a separate system or some place where there's some compromise of the pipe so that your groundwater is entering or um, things like that. And this is well known and documented. So here, like, <clears throat> I'm understanding this is data from a, a separate sanitary sewer. Every day we know that there's what we call this diurnal flow, right? People wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you shower, you flush the toilet, um, and the flow rate goes up. You know, here's about noon. And then people come home from work, most folks, right? And, and then um, use more water. So that would be an expected variation in the flow over the day, which is why you've probably been hearing about folks taking 24 hour composite samples, um, you know, taking a little sample from all across the day so that you're getting a more representative sample. And um, those could be the example I just gave was it was spread out by time, but you could also spread out your sampling by flow, you know, say, I want to capture the um, normalizing to the changes in flow. The, the bottom plot here is showing you, um, here's like a typical daily diurnal flow variation across a week. And here's a case where there's wet weather. Um, so you can imagine that if we're trying to use the, the sewers to do monitoring, particularly if you're further downstream, it, we have a good idea of what's going on in base flow, but you might be diluting the signal that we're looking for during wet weather, even in those separate sanitary systems. There is interest in doing in-network monitoring a bit further out than those individual buildings. So I thought I'd give you an idea. Um, here's a, a map of the Hoboken sewer. Uh, I was able to pull that because um, some good folks that we know up at Stevens had done a bit of work here. So this is a published map of their, their combined sewer system to give you an idea. Usually they're, they're branching pipes that, that come together. Um, so there's, there's ethical reasons not to sample an individual home. The benefit of this sampling the sewage is that we get this mix of a lot of people um, and reduce the workload in that way. So I show you this in part because a good in-system place to do sampling might be at the pump stations. Um, and I also mention it because it might be useful as well. You know, we're engineers. How do you model these systems? I thought I'd remind us of how that's done. Um, so I like this picture. It shows you that. Part of the system might be gravity flow in some places. After you go to a pump station, it'll be a, a force main. So I know some of my former students are in here and got the pleasure of taking fluid mechanics with me. So we have to speak about some of the, the modeling. Um, and for wastewater epidemiology, this might be of interest because of the hydraulic residence time, right? What if you have something entering the sewer that you have a decay rate for? And there's definitely decay rates available for different uh, coronaviruses out there. Um, so in that case, it'd be useful to know your residence time. So knowing something about the being able to model the flow could be useful. So for the gravity sewers, it'd be open channel flow. They're designed so that there's some headspace in there. Um, and you remember for open channel flow, we use good old Manning equation. Um, so it's a function of the wedged perimeter and um, uh, a friction manning coefficient here for, you know, how smooth the pipe wall is. For the pressure means, we can go to our pipe flow equation. So one step further from Bernoulli to energy equation, accounting for the head loss and such. Um, folks can do this. Usually I make my students do this in spreadsheet models, but you can quickly move up like EPA swim, uh, get network models to do these. Um, so more than just back calculating how many people were you know, entering, uh, having their feces and urine enter the system, we might also be interested in how long it took for uh, the that wastewater that entered to get to your sampling point, particularly for something that might decay on uh, uh, with a half life that's relevant to this. So those are types of questions that we've been interested in answering, answering questions about the potential for retardation and decay and growth. And I should say for growth, um, <clears throat> our focus up until the pandemic had been antibiotic resistant bacteria. So that's a case where you can get growth, right? 
bacteria, a lot of enteric bacteria can grow outside of your gut as well in the water. That's why we have the wastewater treatment plant to help inactivate them before they get put out into the surface water. Um, growth, I just wanted to say, I, it's not a concern for SARS, like the viruses, right? They need a host to grow in. Um, but when we're thinking about microbes in a larger picture here, I'll include growth. <clears throat> so with that, we've also been interested in, here's sort of a cartoon cross section of a, a sewer pipe that has some sediment in it. So there will be solids in wastewater. Um, some of it might be coarse and granular, like if eggshells go down or grit or dirt from washing, you know, washing fruit or vegetables, something like that. There'll also be mobile solids here. It's just showing you the percent of organic carbon. Um, the sewer pipes will also have some biofilm, so some microbes growing on them. Um, and we were interested in looking at some of these different, more than just the wastewater going into the pipe and looking at some of these other materials. Um, and you might think, ah, you know, the wastewater, it should just be flowing through the pipe. And yes, it does. It's great. Thanks environmental engineers that it's not backing up. Um, but there is some evidence for retardation of at least microbial agents in the sewers. So I, I pulled for you this study from another lab back in the early 2000s where they did a single flush of some polio virus, inactivated polio virus. Um, and then they went to the wastewater intake and tried to measure it. And they could still measure it after four days after it had been flushed. So there's something more going on with this system. Either perhaps the flow wasn't continuous or perhaps there was some um, absorptions getting stuck to some of those biofilms or maybe there's some association with sediments that, that settle and, and move. But man, they did, a I think, a back of the envelope calculation here. And that's after a lot of water passed through the system. Um, and other considerations, I suppose a little less engineering, but something you might want to take into account if you're trying to like back calculate from the measurements you take at the wastewater um, intake would be there, there's a, just a ton of human variables to consider. And here I just pulled one, which is that let's say that you have some, some uh, microbial infection and you're shedding it. Um, the, the shedding is variable. It's variable by person um, and it varies in time. Usually, like the, the common rule is that a lot, usually you think that shedding kind of is peaking right before or right near, like when your maximum symptoms are. Um, but this is data I pulled from the literature just to give you an example of, of Norwalk virus. Um, here's folks that were um, where people were experimentally infected, you know, volunteers that had consent and all. Um, so here's people shedding, um, this is concentration per gram of feces, where they had no clinical um, signs of gastroenteritis. Here's where they had um, just vomiting, and here's where they had vomiting and diarrhea. Sorry if this is like your happy hour tonight. But the, the point is, you see that not all of these are peaking at the same time. Not all of them reach the same peak concentration. Um, so if you really want to say, okay, we took this measurement at the wastewater intake, it means this many people are sick right now, and at this point, um, you start to see that it ends up being uh, kind of a, a challenging question. So with all of that in, in mind, we were lucky enough to get some funding from the National Science Foundation to study what we called microbial agents in sewers. Um, and the, the focus here was antibiotic resistant microbes. So I thought I'd share a little bit of the results of that study here. Um, and if you're interested, the award number is there and you can go and read the project description and get links to the papers that are out. Um, so why we're interested in antibiotic resistance, just a little background. Um, the case of the clinical incidence of resistant infections has been increasing. The number of new approvals for new antibiotics has been decreasing, which um, environmental engineers have been saying for a while, you know, this creates a sustainability issue and wondering what can we do to preserve the antibiotics that we have um, by preventing increases in resistance in different environments. So I'll show you some results that we're focusing on the DNA that encodes for these resistance functions. So one acronym is ARGs, so the antibiotic resistance genes. Um, there are hundreds of these, 
Some of them are very specific to a specific antibiotic. Some are very general. One example here might be an efflux pump. It'd be something that's in a membrane that helps just pump out the antibiotic. It doesn't necessarily break it down or treat it, but in that way, it protects the microbe from it. We also, uh, I find this to be an interesting topic in part because um, it's not only the bacteria that's carrying it that matters. Like if you kill the bacteria, there's still some non-zero risk associated with it, not to make anyone scared, but there is evidence that extracellular DNA can be uptaken by competent cells and then they can get that resistance function. Um, how often this happens is unclear, but it's certainly possible. So it makes it it's sort of like this next step that uh, folks would say, you know, we don't only need to kill these bacteria, but we should also think about what happens to the, the DNA. And the other thing is, even if you have a resistance gene that's in a cell that's not pathogenic, there's some chance that it'll share it with a pathogen, right? That, that, that can happen. And these are some of the mechanisms. So it could be introduced by a phage, it's like a bacterial virus, um, or uh, sharing of plasmids. And if that wasn't convincing, I'll give you one example um, that, that folks in this field use a lot, which is NDM1. Um, so if you've heard about superbugs in the news, here's a, a headline from a while back, a superbug NDM1 is spreading in a U.S. hospital. Um, but it wasn't referring, it wasn't like NDM1 was like E. coli. No, it was referring to the resistance genes. It was referring to a genetic element that had widespread, that had resistance to a number of antibiotics. Um, it's been found in multiple species. So some motivation for the whales, I'll show some of our data. And we were kind of interested in this, in the sewer beyond those reasons just for monitoring, but to find out, you know, there's antibiotics that folks take and there's some portion of those that get excreted unchanged. Um, and that varies a lot, just like the shedding of the microbial agents themselves. But here's just some data showing you antibiotics that folks have measured um, from a review that we did in either hospital sewage or municipal sewage. And anytime one of these dots is above the red line, it's telling you that it's above some predicted no effects level for selecting for resistance. So we're like, do you see selection in the, in the sewers? Those types of questions. So we did a sampling, uh, a field study um, I think this was back in 2017, 2018. Um, and we took composite samples of wastewater. So here's an example of a composite sampler. You see all these individual tubes. They would each be filled up at a, at a different time or triggered for different flow. Um, so we took wastewater composite samples and we also took sewer sediment samples. So again, sorry if this is your happy hour. <laughs> um, so from a, a CSO um, storage tank, um, from some pump stations, some wet wells, and some utilities were nice enough to take us out and pop some, um, some manholes as well. So here are some examples of the results. Um, we compared the sewer sediment to the wastewater, and we're reporting it as sort of a concentration, like how many microbes, you could think of it this way, a rough way to think of it is how many microbes had these genes? So here's an example for a gene that encodes for macrolide resistance. And what you should see is all those boxes are kind of overlapping. So basically we didn't see, there didn't seem to be a difference in how concentrated this gene was and the microbes in the sediment or the water. There seemed to be no difference by season. Um, that's what the different colors are here for. And whether we went to a combined or a separate sanitary sewer, it all looked the same. So, okay. Um, here's another example. Here's NDM1, that was that superbug that I mentioned earlier. Here, we only consistently detected it in the sewer sediment, not necessarily in the wastewater. Why is that? Um, there's probably a few reasons. One could be that bacteria that carry that gene, they might just have a niche in the sediment. Um, it could be the wastewater samples weren't large enough or timed correctly to capture it, um, but interesting to us nonetheless. And one more example here I'll show you is for this gene, Sol1 encodes for sulfonamide resistance. Um, and here we did see seasonal patterns, basically higher concentrations in the winter and fall compared to the summer sampling that we did, um, which is not necessarily surprising. There can be some seasonal patterns with some illnesses, and therefore there are some seasonal patterns with when certain antibiotics are prescribed. 
Um, we also went really deep into these samples. If you've heard work about microbiomes in the news, um, here we did what we call a shot, got a shotgun metagenome. Basically, we said break apart all the bacteria in these samples and sequence all the DNA, all the DNA that we could get sequences for, and then did databases, database searches to see, um, to label which genes were encoding for different resistance functions. Um, so these are just sewer sediments from combined sewers, fall and winter and summer, and a heat map, just the more red, the higher the concentration. So I'll just highlight a few here. Um, the, the highest red one you see are for these multi-drug efflux pumps. Um, it's, it's not necessarily surprising. Um, they do a lot of things other than help bacteria deal with, with, um, with antibiotics. They might help pump out heavy metals and other toxins. Um, and some of the other higher concentration ones we saw were for tetracyclines and mac macrolides. When you try to get all the DNA in a sample, you can, you can look for a lot of things. So we would also capture some of the DNA virus, uh, the virus DNA in the samples. Um, so here are some groups, uh, genera, just like groups of viruses that we saw. Um, from our different systems, one, two, three, in summer and winter. And I'll just point out a few here. So here's norovirus. 67% um, of the uh, foodborne illnesses in the U.S., I think, are caused by norovirus. So you can see that we, we captured some of those in our winter sampling. Um, simplex, I believe some herpes viruses uh, fall in, in that category. We've also done some work, you know, it's great doing this field work, but it raises a lot of questions, but it's always nice to have the ability to do some controlled studies. So we've also been simulating the sewer pipe uh, in the lab to try to understand a little more. Um, so if you remember, here's our sewer pipe and the different possible matrices, wastewater, biofilm, and solids. We were interested in looking at the biofilms for these studies. Um, biofilms like, um, you know, you brush your teeth in the morning and the evening, you're removing plaque, that's an example of a biofilm. Um, so it's just microbes that are growing attached to the surface. Um, and one thing to note is that they grow this like sticky extracellular substance around them. Um, and that could be something where um, not only do you have the bacteria growing in here, but other things can get stuck to that. Um, so in order to simulate that in the lab, thinking back to fluids, a good old dynamic similitude, it wouldn't be a great idea to take your sewer pipe and just size it down um, necessarily, right? Going from your prototype to your model. Um, we were also thinking about dynamic similitude. So we wanted to make sure we could uh, recreate the shear stress that you would expect in one of those pipes. Um, and we decided that the best way for us to do that was with this annular biofilm reactor. So basically, it's this spinning cylinder. You put in different um, material coupons. You know, PVC and concrete is what we use to simulate these. Um, and we went out to a partner utility and went from their wet well right at the intake, pumped water in, spun this, and tried to grow the. Try, and wanted to see what what kind of microbes we saw growing on here. So that was one way we could sort of simulate the sewer pipe and control things a little better. Right, compare different materials with the same wastewater. So this is what it looks like. Uh, the reactor that we built looks like. Um, you have wastewater getting pumped in, wastewater in here, uh, a motor controller and a motor spinning this so we can simulate that shear. And this is all beautiful, beautiful biofilm growth on there. So it's not surprising, we know that there's antibiotic resistant microbes in the, the sewage, and it's not surprising that some we would find in the biofilms, whether it's because they're growing there or because some of the DNA got stuck or what have you. Um, so here you can see over time, and the main thing here was one conclusion was if we're feeding it the same wastewater, these biofilms were similar no matter the material that we use. So we just compared PVC and concrete to potential materials. We also did some work on looking at the microbiome here. We did it for the simulated sewer. Here I just showed some examples. We wanted to compare what we simulated to the field. Um, and the red bars here are just, I highlight, you know, groups that contain pathogens. They're not all pathogens, um, but if you did drill down deeper, there could be some pathogens in there. Again, not surprising. We know that they're in sewage. 
So probably why folks signed up today was to hear a little bit more about our COVID pilot. So I thought I'd um, give a little teaser of what we've been doing. Um, when cases started to rise in the US, we started talking to one of a potential utility partner in early March. And our lab got shut down on March 20th as you know, Rutgers shut down. We donated our personal protective equipment to the hospitals the, the following week. Um, and then as things, uh, the new normal started to come into, started to see what it looked like, we started trying to get the pilot going. So I submitted a proposal in mid-April, we got biosafety approval in mid-May. And since about mid-June, we've been doing weekly sampling of at wastewater utilities um, in New Jersey that I'll say serve um, almost 2 million people. Um, we're incredibly thankful for our utility partners. Um, we've been feeding them the data weekly and they share it with the public health officials in their towns. Um, and yeah, they've been really leaders in advocating for you know, doing what they can to help out. And this is one way. So we're very appreciative for them. Um, so we've been sampling from that mid-June through now, and we'll, we'll keep going as long as the pilot funds we have and continue. Um, so the way that we're doing it, like I said before, is we take these composite wastewater influence samples. We take a 24-hour sample. The utilities do that for us. Thank you for anyone that's here from there. Um, and basically the next steps are concentrating the, the samples and precipitating out the viruses so that we can measure them. So do um, take our wastewater samples, process them, extract the RNA. Um, COVID is an RNA virus. Um, so that's the, the type of genetic material that's there. And then like you've probably heard in the news, we do a qPCR test. Um, so it's quantitative polymerase chain reaction. The idea is just that. We make copies of a portion of the genome um, that allows us to measure how much would be in a sample. Um, so the instrument looks something like this. This is a bit of a look of the output, something that one of these that peaks a little earlier is a higher concentration. These are lower concentration samples. And this is not a stock photo. This is our beautiful lab in weeks fall. So hopefully you all can come visit one day. Um, so when you think of all of the genes that are involved in the, the genome of SARS-CoV-2, um, the CDC published primer sets, basically, um, I'll just say they, they have a method where you can target uh, certain parts of it. And what I think a lot of the labs are doing and we're doing is looking for nucleocapsid, a portion of the nucleocapsid protein. So something that we can measure and say that, yes, there's genome there, but we're not necessarily, um, you wouldn't want to be making copies of like a virulence factor, you know, something that would be, have potential higher biosafety risk. So if you think of when we started our pilot, here's some data from the New Jersey COVID dashboard um, peaking. We started around when New Jersey was opening up. We were really rushing to get going. I was like, come on. We got to get going. So we need to know the baseline because things are going to go up. And I have to say, like, congrats, everyone. We've been doing great. Um, so our sampling has been going on this period. And I have to say the highest concentration we observed was in one of our first samples. And since then, we've been bouncing around the lower limit of quantitation for the most part. A lot of days we're, we're not seeing um, signal that we've sampled. And it's not because we're not good at what we do. Um, we do matrix spikes, you know, spike in a little bit of the, the gene target to see how much we get back. Um, recoveries were like 90%. So then theoretically 90% of what's in the sample, we should be able to measure. Um, and then I mentioned our biofilm reactor. We did a small pilot of that at one of our utility partners. So despite the fact that the, the SARS-CoV-2 signal has been quite low in the utilities that we've been working with um, this summer and continuing into this fall, um, we could measure, we could find some of the, um, some signal in our biofilm reactor, which is not necessarily surprising, right? It's not necessarily something to be so concerned about, um, except, you know, for cases of utility workers, it's just telling you that there's some of this is getting stuck in the biofilm. Um, 
And we also think it's useful for things like the back calculation, right? If we know this is some portions getting stuck in the biofilm, it'll help us do back of the envelope calculations to say, you know, how much could be so called retarded or getting stuck in the, uh, you know, moving in between the wastewater and the biofilm as it moves down the, the pipe. Um, so, yes, we're measuring uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 in sewage, and I'm sure you've heard reports in the news of others. So I just wanted to mention, remind us that there's um, really not evidence that the, this virus is viable in wastewater. Um, and even if it is viable in wastewater, we have um, this infection that we know is very good at inactivating the types of like enveloped viruses of which SARS-CoV-2 is one. Um, and there's also from expert panels from here, I just pulled this from the Water Environment Federation, one of the professional organizations for folks working in the wastewater, stormwater field generally. Um, there's also considered to be a very, very low chance, they think, of having a, a fecal oral route of you know, of workers contracting this through wastewater, it's considered unlikely. Um, this was what they've been saying for months. It's still the update as of earlier this week. Um, and if things change, I encourage you to follow their website. I think they do a great job of um, explaining information about things you care about in, in water. If you're interested in learning more about any of our research, I showed you uh, the link, the, the project number earlier. These are some of the papers that I shared some results from today. And I hope that I used we the whole time I spoke about this because I just run the lab and advise the students. The real hard work you guys know is always done by, by the students. So a lot of the work I showed you on the antibiotic resistance was done by Alessia Aramo, who got her PhD in 2018. Um, William Morales Medina took up some of that work and he's been um, just amazing piloting our, you know, getting our COVID project off the ground. And since it's grown, um, Stephanie joined the group. And we're always thankful as well to the undergrads that help out. Um, they're not in the lab right now since, uh, since the shutdown, but they were working on the antibiotic resistance work and working with some uh, less, than, less than wonderful, <laughs> well-smelling samples. Um, we're always thankful for the folks that fund our research. So that's, that's all of you who are paying taxes that go to the National Science Foundation. And we're thankful for Rutgers that took a lead in giving some, uh, letting us start some pilot projects here. So we have some funding for the, the work that I shared today on the, the COVID from that. Yeah, so my contact information is there. Um, hopefully you made it through. Hopefully I did not spoil your dinner. And if there happen to be any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Nicole, very much. Uh, I would say this was certainly a learning experience for me. I think I learned from this presentation of what your research is about. Uh, I'm inviting everybody to submit questions, uh, and uh, we have received one. So uh, the question is, how would you comment on the fate of COVID virus through the wastewater treatment system? Um, there, uh, conventional wastewater treatment usually involves, um, like a, a stereotypical way might be, you start with activated sludge. The first step there is you use microbes to eat the, the carbon that's in the wastewater and they get so fat they settle out. So there can certainly be some removal of pathogens during a uh, following activated sludge when those fat microbes settle out. Um, there can be biofiltration at some treatment plants, but really the end of the line for pathogens in wastewater is always the disinfection steps. Um, so most plants use uh, chlorine or some derivative of it, or increasingly um, UV disinfection. And UV is also great for, for something like a virus because it, um, you could think of it as messes up the DNA, right? It causes thymine dimers, so um, it's hard to make copies of the DNA if it's there, which would be the same for RNA. Okay. Uh, while we are waiting for additional questions, um, 
I was thinking of, oh, can you explain uh, what should be, let's say, if we have community spreading of a virus, uh, what should be the strategy in using uh, source, using wastewater to identify, for example, where are concentrations? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is, uh, my, my feeling is everything we've seen in the news is what it should be, that it should be, it can be an early, an early warning. Um, and then that information can be communicated to the, um, the folks that are working on the systems, the public health leaders there to disseminate that knowledge, as well as um, like we've seen on some of the, the reports where they're doing even more concentrated sampling, where you can have a very good idea of what, um, of where it's coming from. Like when you get down to the university dorm level, um, you know, following the steps that I think we've seen uh, Arizona and NJIT and others do is, is appropriate. Um, and then eventually, maybe this goes back to what it had been, you know, monitoring for polio. It had been a lot of monitoring for um, vaccination and different types of spread in the community and things like that. So, um, our, I think a lot of folks' vision right now is that this is not, this might not be going away as folks are building more infrastructure and knowledge for this. Uh, we have a question whether a recording of the presentation will be available. Yes, it will be. Uh, it seems that uh, these are the all, and these are all questions we have received. Um, so, if, if there are no additional questions, uh, I would like to thank everybody who attended this very interesting presentation, and I am certainly very grateful. To our speaker, Dr. Farenfeld, and I wish you all to have a very nice evening. Well, thanks so much for joining me.